Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending AACP's webinar with Stasha Gominak, presenting three simple steps for healthier sleep. I'm Shaylin, the Association Manager for the AACP, and I will be the host of the webinar tonight. The webinar is approximately 50 minutes in length, followed by a 10-minute Q&A session. Please enter any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. The AACP has no conflicts of interest. Registrants can expect to receive a recording of this presentation via email within five to seven business days, and AACP members attending live will receive their CE certificate of attendance within 30 days of the webinar air date. A couple of upcoming events for the AACP are our, our next complimentary webinar, July 12th, with Eric Phelps presenting the Airway Report. Also, for education, camaraderie, and the latest in craniofacial pain, be sure to visit aacfp.org and register for this year's annual symposium in San Antonio, Texas, 11th and 12th, August 11th and 12th with a pre-conference on August 10th. I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, Stasha Gominak. Stasha grew up and attended college in California and moved to Houston for medical school at Baylor College of Medicine, where she received an MD degree in 1983. Her neurology residency was done at Harvard-affiliated Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. She practiced neurology in the San Francisco Bay Area from 1991 to 2004, then moved with her husband to Tyler, Texas. Starting in 2004, she began to dedicate more of her practice to the treatment of sleep and sleep disorders. In 2012 and 2016, she published two pivotal articles about the global struggle with worsening sleep and the possible causes and solutions. In 2016, she retired from her practice to have more time to teach, and she currently divides her time between right sleep coaching sessions for private individuals and teaching other clinicians the right sleep method of sleep repair. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Stasha. Okay, we're going to be talking about sleep. And since this is really very applicable to your subspecialty, treating patients who have cranial facial pain, we're going to be talking about how this relates to patients' pain. And I have only one disclosure. I give courses to teach this information in more depth to anyone who wants to learn more. And most of my clients are sleep dentists. But anyone who has an interest in sleep can take this course. The first question we should have is, why is lousy sleep the new normal? And has it always been this way? And because I'm old, I can tell you that it has not always been this way. And I'm actually going to try to teach you what I think is the reason for this happening. And the first question is, is this relevant to my patients who are suffering with pain? Absolutely it is. And I want you to be thinking about the patients who keep you up at night, not the ones where you have complete success and it's easy and you feel very satisfied. The ones that keep you up and you're thinking, why didn't Mr. Her get better the way everyone else did? And why didn't Ms. so-and-so get better? And why does she still have these terrible facial pains? The underlying question is, is there something in the background that we haven't been seeing? Is there a disease in the background that we're not treating? And if we did, would we have a better success? In my view, pain of any origin only gets better if we get into deep sleep. I'm gonna teach you some things about that. That doesn't mean that anything you do manipulate in the mouth is not important. It just means that the body always heals itself. We try to help, but healing really only happens in sleep. What about insomnia? This is very difficult with pain patients. Does the pain keep them from sleeping? Because that's what they perceive. Or is the not sleeping causing the pain? And it took me a while, but after a while I realized, oh, everyone who has chronic pain in my neurology practice 
always has a sleep disorder in the background. Why am I not treating that as well? Chronic pain is increasing dramatically over the last 40 years. The opioid epidemic does not affect people, in my view, who don't have pain. Most people do not get addicted to the opioids unless they start with pain at the beginning. That means if we can get their pain better, we can address many of the problems in the US. What's changed in the last 40 years that's affecting our sleep? I'm gonna tell you right up front, we've all moved indoors. Here's what it was like when I was young, played outside, slept under a fan, too hot to be inside. There weren't any televisions. There was no air conditioning. When they were farming outside, they did not have an air conditioned covered tractor. We ate outside, we lived outside. And now, especially since COVID, we moved indoors. So now starting in the 1980s, air conditioning, television, computer, sunscreen, play inside, live inside. And anyone who moves up the socioeconomic ladder. So if you're a female and went to college and you have a career, you have a lot of risk factors. You're now usually no longer digging in the dirt. So you're not outside. You might actually be in the army for a while and exercise outside, but as you move up into your more developed jobs and you get an executive position, you're usually working indoors. So the lecture is titled Three Simple Steps and I'm gonna give you those at the beginning. Three important things you probably don't know. The brain runs, runs the oral airway during sleep. This is not to minimize the anatomic concerns and the anatomic interventions that the sleep dentists do because I have been taught so much about the neurology of the oral airway and how we can improve the anatomy. And I had four teeth removed when I was a teenager and I am now currently doing an expansion that has sort of the Invisalign pieces that are being used to slowly move the teeth. So this is to be used and to be thought of as being done in parallel with the anatomic interventions. The second thing to know is vitamin D actually runs the sleep. I'm gonna explain why that is. And most shocking of all, the microbiome, the bacteria that live in our intestine runs the sleep too. Here's what's happened. Moving indoors means we have a low vitamin D. Even if you think you're an outside person, probably right now you're indoors. So a low vitamin D means ruined sleep and because the vitamin D supports the microbiome and it's only in the last two years that's been relatively well reported, we didn't pay attention to the fact that losing your microbiome ruins your sleep. We're gonna talk a little bit about how to fix that. But first I wanna teach you about vitamin D and why the name of it is so important and why it's not a bone vitamin. I'm gonna go over the history of how this mistake actually happened. But first, I wanna give you the final correct answer. Our sleep is linked to two planetary cycles. You know about one of them, the circadian rhythm. And that is established by light coming through the eye, actually using retinoids, which are at the back of our eye, retina. That transmits photon energy into a neurologic neurotransmitter message that then goes to the pineal gland and links our sleep cycle on a 24 hour basis to the day night cycle of the planet. But there's a second cycle, a 365 day cycle that links us to winter and summer. And we are linked again through a chemical that unfortunately was called a vitamin, but is really a hormone that we make on our skin called hormone D or vitamin D. And that links us to the annual cycle so that we get fat and we hibernate in the winter so that we can make it through a long span of time with snow on the ground and no food available. So I am not the head of the Stanford Sleep Center. Why am I here talking to you? It's happened by accident and it's not something I expected, but I think I'm so passionate about this topic that I want everybody to understand it the way I do. So here's my journey that led me to being here lecturing to you. And this was happening quite a while ago now, almost 20 years ago when I was first moved to Tyler, Texas and about half of my neurology practice was daily headache sufferers. One of them said, you know, all these medicines you neurologists have given me haven't really helped my sleep. My husband says I snore like a train. 
I want a sleep study. And I said, well, I don't know anything about that. So I can't really do it. And she insisted. So I sent her for a sleep study and she had sleep apnea. She had no drops in oxygen. That's really important. We've been handed this explanation by the pulmonologist that it's the stress of oxygen drops that leads to the accompanying diseases of sleep apnea. But she did not have drops in oxygen. She did stop breathing. But more importantly, for what I'm doing and what I'm telling you about, she put on this torture device and her headaches went away, which to me was shocking. I mean, I don't see this as having any placebo effect. Nobody wants to wear these things. So if her headaches went away and it was in, within a few weeks, to me, that meant her inability to stay in the deeper phases of sleep was preventing her from healing her chemistry that was causing her migraine. So she had disrupted chemistry, in my view. I'm a neurologist, I think in neurotransmitters. So I started to do sleep studies in all these women who had daily headache. Most of them are young, healthy females who've had a couple of kids, don't have other medical problems. Some of them are around perimenopause time. So I did a lot of sleep studies. By the second year, I was doing sleep studies in anybody who would let me because the women who did have sleep apnea got better on CPAP. But I was disappointed because if they didn't have sleep apnea, I really had nothing to offer except sleeping pills. And I had previously been trained like most MDs, just don't ask them about their sleep because then they want a sleeping pill and then you get into these addictive medicines. So up until this time, I really wouldn't ask much about sleep. Now I'm asking everyone to let me about their sleep and sending them for sleep studies. Now, here's what happened. About two years into it, the pulmonologist who was reading the studies said to me, I don't know if you've noticed this, but the population you're sending to our office is very different than who everyone else is sending, You know, middle-aged, fat males. Um, that's who we've been told to look for sleep apnea. And he said, your, your patients have this really interesting finding that they actually have less REM sleep than they should. Uh, their REM sleep is delayed and they have REM related apnea. And I said, well, I don't think that's on the report. And he said, yeah, I know. And I was like, wait, for two years, I've been looking at these reports, trying to figure out how come these women both are suffering from daily headaches. They're both depressed. They can't remember anything. They have the same complaints and buried inside the study, not on the front page report, is the fact that they're missing one of the phases of deep sleep. And REM sleep, we know, is really related to mood and memory. So I started to learn how to read these reports. And sure enough, my patient group, these young healthy females with nothing wrong with them and nothing to point to to explain this, had REM-related apnea. That means they only stopped breathing in REM sleep. So after a while, I said, Chuck, why, why would they only stop breathing in REM? And he said, well, we get the most paralyzed of all in REM. And I said, wow, creepy. We really get paralyzed? And he said, yeah. And I thought, why don't I know that? And that has to be a neurology issue because this is all run by the brain. So what's this about getting paralyzed? To me, that sounds really, really dangerous. And only in rapid eye movement sleep towards the end of the night do we paralyze the oral airway. Now, interestingly, what me, most people are trained about in sleep and studying sleep is sleep apnea. That means we only stop breathing in REM or we only stop breathing when we're asleep. Well, that means that we have the same oral airway configuration when we're awake, but this paralysis makes you see things in a different way. Oh, what if they have a normal airway when they're awake? and they get too paralyzed and their airway collapses during the night. So at that point, I started to think about this in a very, very different way. One, if I get paralyzed in sleep, that means everybody's been getting paralyzed in sleep for millions of years because the way we get paralyzed is certain nerves that are in the brainstem actually turn off our spinal cord control of our body. Well, that part of the brain actually has been paralyzing us probably for millions of years. Now, the other thing that I started to think about was these 32 year old women that shouldn't have any pain anywhere, 
they also have not just daily headache, but a lot of them have ankle pain or toe pain or heel pain or hip pain or pains that I don't think are normal to have, especially in women who are normally active, exercising, et cetera. So I began to wonder if these leg movements that we would sleep, see during sleep, periodic limb movements of sleep, were actually a manifestation that said we weren't getting paralyzed enough. So let me go through this hypnogram with you in a very general, quick way. If you're not wearing a sleep tracker, this might be new for you. On the bottom axis, we have time. On the <clears throat> vertical axis, we have what phase of sleep are we in? We get paralyzed completely in rapid eye movement sleep and deep sleep, which is also called slow wave sleep. Deep sleep happens more towards the beginning of the night. And we do this in little blocks of time. And in between, we go to light sleep. That doesn't mean we are awake. It means that we wake up to a lighter phase of consciousness. That means we can hear, we can feel things. It's kind of like we're coming up to make sure our environment is safe because in between when we're paralyzed, we're very vulnerable. So in deep sleep is the only phase when children grow. So it turns out that the release of growth hormone is completely locked to slow wave sleep. That's interesting because it turns out as we move through puberty and we stop growing, we don't stop releasing growth hormone. Instead, as we move through puberty, we start releasing growth hormone in a pulsatile way. That means that same chemical that used to promote growth is now promoting repair. That implies even though we don't know why we get paralyzed, that the moving parts must get paralyzed in order to repair. That means somebody that's bruxing all night long could have temporal mandibular degeneration and pain because they're not inhibiting their movements correctly. And that can be a chemical problem as well as an anatomic problem. Obviously the brain doesn't get paralyzed because it's not a moving part. So only the moving parts appear to get paralyzed. And as you look at this graph, as we get towards the end of the night, we start to have rapid eye movement sleep. Most of my patients would say the exact same thing. Oh, I wake up at 3 a.m. and then I I'm awake for an hour. And then I really don't sleep as deeply after that. So there was a very constant complaint that waking at 3 a.m. And I realized that many of my patients in the past had said, I wake up with a headache at 3 a.m. I had no context in which to understand that, but it turns out there are very, very time-linked things that we do and we do them with chemicals. So in studying this to try to figure out, well, if we're not getting paralyzed correctly, like we're getting too paralyzed and not paralyzed enough, where does that happen? And this is in neurology. These are areas of the brain stem that were first elucidated their, their function in sleep in the 1960s and 70s um, at the Stanford Sleep Study Center that was the very first place that they studied sleep. And the sleep switches so-called are here. The actual name is the nucleus pontus reticularis oralis caudalis, which is why we call them sleep switches. And this is the area of the brain that paralyzes us. Now, interestingly, there are two important functions of the, what is called the reticular activating system, the timing of what we do. And we have a very special clock in our brain, in our body. Our brain always knows what time it is. So a clock that tells us when to do things and the other system that paralyzes us. And as I said, this part of the brain is called the reptilian brain, which means it was exactly the same in the dinosaurs. What that means is, this part of the brain has been working normally in all the other animals on the planet. Every single animal sleeps and has to get paralyzed and then has to stop that paralysis so they can get up and move around for 250 million years. That means I'm probably not gonna figure out exactly how this works in detail, but all I have to figure out is why it failed in humans over the last 40 years. So what if our paralysis goofs up? Okay, what could that present? So I'm talking to my patients for things that they have to put up with my babbling about. Apnea could be too paralyzed. Bruxism, leg movements, REM behavioral disorder, sleepwalking, that could be not paralyzed enough. One brainstem location. So it's a place we can look at 
and ask why is that happening? Now, in the neurology of what happens here, in order to be perfectly paralyzed, you actually have to have a firing rate that is regularized. So unlike the electricity in the wall that goes with a constant stream of electrons, if I wanna hold my arm up like this and I want it to stay exactly in the same place, I have to send an up message at a certain rate and match a down message at a certain rate. And then my arm stays in the middle. Those rates of firing are actually run by neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, epinephrine, acetylcholine. There are many neurotransmitters that are playing a role in our paralysis and our timing and our ability to transition through these phases of sleep. So at this point, I'm realizing it's not just the airway, it's the airway and the brain. Once I left neurology and began to learn about uh, airway dentistry, I actually think that we need each other. So we actually have two problems. Do we have the proper neurochemistry to achieve deep sleep and get paralyzed correctly? Because there will be people in your practice who you're seeing for pain and or airway who now have a normal airway, but they still have pain. So the second question is, while we're paralyzed, is the opening big enough? You've made the airway big enough. Oh, the second part, the part that I do has to be addressed. On my side, once I've done the neurology and the chemistry, I have to make sure there's a sleep dentist who's seen my patient as well. And by the way, could my kid or wife or husband have leg pain because their legs are still moving all night and therefore focally in that part of their body, they do not have the opportunity to repair. So I'm thinking of it all in this way. And then something pivotal happens to me. One, there are no articles that are addressing this. There are basic science articles about the rate of firing of dopaminergic pacemaker cells in the brainstem. There are articles about this particular nucleus, but nobody in the sleep study world is talking about this. Now, I then have an 18 year old with a terrible sleep study and she came to see me because she had daily headache. And when she comes back, her headaches are gone, but she says, I'm so tired. Is there anything you can do for me? And I'm looking at her sleep study and it is horrible. As far as she's concerned, she sleeps fine. She slept for 10 hours. But when you can see inside her sleep, she has 35 awakenings to light sleep, not to consciousness. So she's not aware that she's not able to get into deep sleep. She has no apnea, no respiratory related arousals, but she also has no deep sleep at all. So I'm looking at this thinking, this is terrible. She's gonna be seeing me for a stroke or a heart attack. She's aging faster than I am at age 18. She happened to have a B12 that was very low. Now, the thing that's weird here is I was thinking of sleep as a single cell because I'm thinking about these cells and their firing rates. So I'm thinking of the B12 deficiency in a totally different way. I'm thinking, well, what do those little cells use B12 for? Uh, they, I don't know anything about the B vitamins. We've been trained away from the B vitamins as MDs. Could it be that this is a raw material that these cells need and therefore these pacemaker cells, they are failing before other parts of her body. So for the very first time, I think, what if sleep disorders could be a deficiency state? Wouldn't that be amazing because then we could replace whatever it is they were deficient in. So I start sending them back for B12 shots and many of the patients, not all, maybe a quarter of them had low B12. And when they would take the shots, there were some really important things that happened. They'd say, I get two good nights after my shot, but 28 bad ones. So they can tell the difference when you supply the B12. Then it turns out they're given the vial and the syringes because Medicare or the insurance companies don't pay for injection in the doctor's office anymore. And they say, you know, why are we giving this once a month I'm really giving mine once a week. So there's some clinical evidence that you really need to be giving B12 daily. And we changed to a daily pill of B12. But what also happens right at that time that's pivotal is I start to check B12 levels. And while I'm checking them, one of my patients says, my vitamin D level was low and my doctor added vitamin D and it helped my wrist pain. And remember, I was thinking if they're not paralyzed, maybe they could get pain. So I'm, I'm not smart about vitamin D or B12, but I'm drawing blood anyway, and I add a vitamin D level. And so this is a prospective study done very naively 
And everyone in my practice who has a sleep disorder and has a bad sleep study, and I'm checking their B12 and D. And just by accident, I happen to be checking it in the fall between August and December. And 25%, maybe a quarter had B12 deficiency, the sicker patients, but everybody had a D deficiency. That won't surprise you now because in the last four or five years since COVID, D has become front page news. So that would not by itself be anything to alert to. But I then had an experience in December of 2009. Two of my patients who are wearing CPAP, both of the males, both with D levels that were a little higher than the females said, hey, you told me that CPAP would help my headaches, but it never did. But I'll tell you, the last time I was here, you told me to get that vitamin D. I started to take it. And then within about three weeks, my sleep got better. And my headaches went away. Two guys told me within that within two days of each other. It was Christmas. And at that point, I went to a literature search. So the first two search terms were, this, were sleep and vitamin D, no hits on PubMed. But then the next one was vitamin D in the brain. And I dump into Dr. Walter Stump, who is a brilliant man who started to write about vitamin D receptors. And he has already done a set of experiments in the 1980s that show the nucleus reticularis pontus oralis caudalis. Like who even knows about that nucleus? Nobody does. He's already shown that there are vitamin D receptors in this nucleus that paralyzes us. And I'm thinking, wait, why don't I know this? Why, why don't the sleep experts know this? If vitamin D is running this area and he has an entire contextual framework it says D runs hibernation. Well, hibernation has sleep as part of it. So it's also interesting to note that this particular nucleus that he's reporting is split out into three separate areas. So one, the oral airway is a piece of this that gets specifically paralyzed in REM sleep. If you look down below that, chest wall and diaphragm is clumped together also. Now that means could I actually have central apnea if these cells are goofed up enough that they actually don't fire appropriately? Yes, that's what it means. That means that obstructive sleep apnea and central apnea could potentially be coming from this nucleus. Now, there are also vitamin D receptors in the locus ceruleus and substantia nigra, which are other nuclei in the brainstem that run the clock function. That means vitamin D is playing a pivotal role in this. Now, I thought it was about bone vitamin too. So until I read Walter's literature, I was quite confused by this because when you pick it up at the store, it says the bone vitamin. So I've spent a lot of time <clears throat> learning about the historical mistakes. This is very important because this has affected dramatically how we do prospective trials in humans. And currently D is a very politically charged item the clinical trials that are poorly organized and will not ever show a positive effect are being run as though they were public health vitamin studies. This is not a vitamin and this is not a public health issue. This is not about putting D in the milk. This is about you and me measuring my D levels so that I can actually have normal hormones in my body and have a normal life. So it's the hibernation hormone. So here, is the history of hormone D. It's not a nutrient, but it is still called a nutrient in all the literature on the internet and in most of the medical literature. I wanna give you a different framework in which to see this. So the word that used to be used for vitamin D deficiency was rickets. Historically, in the 17, 18 and 1900s, these were the descriptions, colicky baby or toddler, cries all the time, won't eat, won't walk, won't play, won't sleep, poor tooth development, early dental caries, increased infection, read that as tubes in the ears. These are kids who are in your practice now. These are still the symptoms of D deficiency, but somehow we have forgotten that if I do a vitamin D level in a child that has all these symptoms, oh, everybody has a low vitamin D and we've arbitrarily stated that a kid can have a vitamin D level of 25 and it's not abnormal, despite having all these symptoms. There were also observations that were done as experiments between the 1700s and 1900s that showed that exposure to sunlight cured rickets. And then in the 1920s, they actually made bulbs that emitted a specific wavelength, UVB, cured rickets. 
in the 1920s, here's an important article. This is a gentleman who is a very well-respected pediatrician, Alfred Hess. He's giving a presentation a little more than 100 years ago, November 15th of 1921. The title is The Prevention and Cure of Rickets by Sunlight. Yet, the first sentence is, rickets is the commonest nutritional disorder occurring among infants. How can it be a nutritional disorder when it's really about being outside? Here's another person who is also a pediatrician writing about this in Boston in 1925. Rickets, the most prevalent disease of early childhood is essentially a disease of civilization. It is the result of man's attempts at self-betterment and the penalty he is paying for an indoor life and a diet of impoverished, preserved and altered foodstuffs. Man was intended by nature to live in the sunlight and eat the food that came to hand. Instead of this, he shut himself up in ill-lighted houses and accustomed himself to exist on foods that are brought from a distance. And for this very reason must be canned, dry, preserved, finely milled and over purified. He's hitting the two major points that are now considered to be the origin of the poorly formed upper palate and jaw in our kids not chewing chewy stuff and not being out in the sun. So the question then is what causes rickets? Well, sun exposure, lack of sun exposure causes rickets. And despite all these findings, medicine was determined that it was a nutrient deficiency and it still won't change its mind. It's really a choice to actually not read the medical literature. What happened next was the x-ray machine came along and because those symptoms I gave you in the child are very nonspecific, having bone x-rays that showed specific findings was really good for the medical textbooks. So they started to focus on those particular findings in the bone and arbitrarily absolutely forgot or ignored the other symptoms that I just told you. So in the 1940s, they were looking for the thing that caused rickets and they looked in the food. So they're using rats, big mistake because rats are nocturnal, they don't go out in the sun and they did find an anti-rickets factor using a bone assay that was in the food, but it was actually being made by mold or fungus growing on the rat food. So they found this thing called D2, which is also a hormone and it is made by fungus that is exposed to sunlight. It's a hormone, but we don't use D2. So D3 is what we use in all other animals on the planet, all the way back to insects. D2 was found first, and that is why we are still giving it to patients, which is tragic. D3 was found 10 years later on the skin of pigs left in the sun. So there were still scientists who had read the literature that said, wait, this was found to be formed by UVB light. That was how they cured kids of rickets. So why don't we look on the skin of somebody that had their skin left in the sun? D2 was found to not work very well in the bones of chickens or dogs, but we ignored that and we kept giving D2 to humans. And we still give D2 to humans. Rats were able to become nocturnal, which is a really cool niche because they come into our house and they run around looking for our food. And that's why we torture them and use them as lab animals because we don't like them. They bother us. They became nocturnal by having a D receptor that could use D2 interchangeably with D3, but humans cannot do that interchangeably. In fact, the patients who had terrible sleep, who had D levels below 10, got much worse when I naively gave them D2 because that was what was recommended. The concept that hormone and nutrient are not anything close to one another is really important. There's one other reason why we use that term nutrient. Animals lick D3 off their fur. So we and pigs are really the only animals on the planet who are bald. That means we can make the D on our skin and absorb it directly, but almost all animals lick their fur or preen their feathers or lick their scales. And so it does come through the mouth, but it's not from eating, it's from lying in the sun. 
And we have continued to say really ridiculous things like salmon is a good source of D. Well, you can actually get estrogen. You can get salmon estrogen that looks very much like human estrogen from eating a piece of salmon also. But that doesn't make estrogen a nutrient. It doesn't make te salmon testosterone a nutrient. Salmon is not a good source for testosterone. So the words vitamin and nutrient have wrongly determined how we're doing our studies and how we're giving this hormone to people. Now, why is that important? Because hormones have levels. The normal is a narrow homeostatically maintained blood level. Too low feels bad, too high feels bad. Lay people know that, oh, Aunt Rosie got really crazy when her thyroid got too high and looked really bad when her thyroid got too low. And would you ever give your child thyroid hormone without checking a thyroid blood level? Never. We don't give hormones without measuring blood levels. So why in the world would we have a skin hormone from UVB light? Because it turns out UVB is the only wavelength that is absent in winter sunlight. All hormones that we use have different effects in different organs of the body to affect our behavior. So there is a winter D state where the D is low and we get dormant, just like trees. We drop our leaves, we get fat, we hibernate. In the summer, there's a higher D state where we grow strong and be active. Now, if you see it that way, then you will not be confused by the misinformation about hormone D. It is not a fat soluble vitamin. It is fat soluble, but so is testosterone and estrogen. They're all made from cholesterol. Does that mean I have to give a fat man more testosterone? No, it means you measure the testosterone level and you adjust the dose based on the blood level. And D is not stored. If you think about what I just told you, if it were made in the summer and used in the winter, then they would equalize. There would be no hibernation. So this was meant to go from a low level for a winter D state and to a high level for a summer D state. And if it was really stored, hibernation would not exist and we would not make it through the snow covered time when there's no available food. So this, this misunderstanding and the use of the word vitamin has meant that this hormone has not been appropriately incorporated into endocrinology and used by medicine. It's meant that it's easily available over the counter, but it's also meant there's huge, huge amount of misinformation. What Walter wrote back in the 1980s was that D affects metabolism, fertility, and sleep, linking them to the seasons to help us survive the winter. In short, we gain weight, we don't have our babies in winter, and we sleep longer in the winter, so we'll make it through. If you think about it a little more deeply, over the last 40 years, as the dermatologists have told us to stay out of the sun, we now have a global population in permanent winter. And by the way, this is behind the amazing epidemic of obesity. We are being taught that being in the sun is bad for us, but we've always lived outdoors. Every other animal lives outdoors. Hormone D has effects all over the body. Now that COVID has come, we've learned about its effects in the immune system, but it has effects in almost every organ in the body. The first article that Walter Stubbs wrote, and this was out of the main D lab of the time run by Hector DeLuca, target cells for 125 D3 in the intestinal tract, the stomach, the kidney, the skin, the pituitary, and the parathyroid, 1979. That means when I was starting medical school, this was already known. These are just some of the articles that Walter published over 30 years. He's now passed away, but he should have won the Nobel Prize for this. Vitamin D3 sites of action in the brain, 1987. Vitamin D3 sites of action in the spinal cord and the sensory ganglia. Does that mean that I can have patients who are D low and it's not doing the right thing and their pain perception may be altered? Absolutely. Vitamin D3 in teeth of rats and humans. Does this mean D3 is playing a role in just routine daily dentistry? Absolutely. This is why old people's teeth fall out. This is why kids recently are presenting with terrible cavities at age two. Vitamin D light and reproduction, 1989. He is actually seeing the epidemic of infertility before it happens. So he can't get his other colleagues 
to understand what he's talking about because we're really at the beginning of all of these things that have become more and more epidemic over the last 40 years. Light vitamin D in psychiatry, uh, etiology and therapy of, of seasonal affective disorder and other mental processes. He wrote that in 1989. Vitamin D receptors in the heart affects on atrial natriuretic factor. This has to do with many of the cardiac diseases that we see all the time. And here is that same physician, Richard Joseph Garland. Rickards is prevalent in all the Northern parts of the civilized world. Recognized first in Northern Europe where it has a strong foothold for three centuries has followed the march of civilization to North America. And these two continents are now at strongholds. India, however, a Southern country containing one of the oldest civilizations in the world is not immune from rickets. The story of rickets there is interesting for among the poorer classes who live on an impoverished diet, but whose women work in the fields and take their babies with them, rickets is unknown. Among the higher castes who marry their women as children, and practice purda or the segregation of the women with their children permanently in darkened houses, rickets has reached a high degree. Even among the women themselves, osteomalacia, considered by some as an adult form of rickets, read that as osteoporosis, is common. The inference is obvious. The infants of the lower castes are protected by rick from rickets by their constant exposure to the sun. What are we seeing now in moms and kids? Low D suppresses ovulation, causing infertility. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is just multiple eggs that are inhibited from ovulating. D receptors cover the placenta, protecting the baby from mom's immune system. We perceive this baby as being a, an actual foreign invader. That means D, which is heavily involved in the blood-brain barrier and the placental blood barrier, are pivotal in preterm delivery and miscarriage. Low D is now linked to preeclampsia. Every successive pregnancy depletes mom's D. And when the D is low for years, her microbiome goes too. Pregnant mom's poor sleep, reflux, back pain reflect her low D. Here are some of the articles that reflect these. Vitamin D infertility, pregnancy lactation, vitamin D preeclampsia, prematurity, early life effects of vitamin D focus on pregnancy and lactation. And here is just one little piece where D actually plays a role in why children can't breathe through their nose. So it increases the risk of inflammation on in the inside of the nose, and it is linked to the problems with autoimmunity and immunity in little kids. So vitamin D3 deficiency increases sinus mucosal dendritic cells in pediatric chronic rhinositis with nasal polyps, and they also increases nasal rhinitis. So all of these things that Walter described back in the 80s have become epidemic. Now I'm going to jump back to the fact that when I saw his articles, I actually called him up and I said, hey, you don't know me, but you've written all these articles about vitamin D and where the receptors are and what it means. And you've written this beautiful contextual framework in which to understand it. Has anybody written about D in sleep? And he said, no. But that makes perfect sense because it runs hibernation. I said, well, I just had this clinical experience where I've measured all the D levels and they all have abnormal sleep studies. And let's see if together we could write a paper. So this was, again, a very naive prospective trial. And really all I did with my patients, I'm a clinician, I'm not a scientist. I just said, hey, how's your sleep now? You're on 2000. Terrible. Oh, that's too bad. You're taking it every day. Yeah, let's do your D level again. And over a period of a couple of years, it became very obvious as the D crossed 60. So there is a specific range in which the sleep gets better. If you go under 60, your sleep gets worse. If you go over 80, your sleep gets worse. So we published this in 2012, more than 10 years ago now. Now, again, why am I here? So I, we just went to the annual American Academy of Sleep Medicine in Indianapolis. I love those meetings. They have these scientific studies that are amazing, but there are no lectures about hormone D and sleep. 10 years have gone by. Now, there are a lot of articles that connect observations in patients who are not sleeping well and D levels. So there are epidemiologic association studies, okay? Now, the other question that I had as I was sitting in the audience over the last four years or so going to these sleep meetings is, is there a reason why we're studying sleep in the way we are? We're studying that almost always in rodents, 
that are nocturnal, sometimes in fruit flies now, which is really interesting. And also we sleep deprived normals. They are not your patients. These are your patients. These are my patients. They are miserable in many different ways. Some of them have terrible pain. We are not asking these patients because we don't think that clinical discussion, that clinical examination is valuable. We're being trained that only drug companies can run clinical trials in a way that will result in important information. Really, it results in something they can make money. The thing I really love about lecturing to dentists is you guys are all tinkerers. You like make little things and you put it in the mouth and you make little teeth. That means every single mouth is completely unique to you. And medicine is being pushed in a totally different direction than that. But that means your observations in your patients are extremely valuable. So I want you to think about the ones where, God, this guy just didn't get better and think that there may be an additional tool that you can use that I can teach you about. Now, the important thing is to remember this, if you only remember one thing, you're gonna need to come to San Antonio to hear this whole story. It turned out vitamin D was not the only deficiency. This wonderful improvement in sleep that I told you about only worked for two years and then our sleep fell apart again. And there were a few things that didn't get better that were really notable. Their uh, irritable bowel symptoms never cleared. I expected them to because I thought that the GI symptoms, IBS showed up in the 80s also. They were exercising more, but they didn't lose weight. That turns out to be linked to the microbiome. And when I had them sleeping better, they ultimately, after two years, began to develop other deficiencies. So the brain started to go low in other things that were needed for normal sleep. So if you want the complete story, you have to come to my lecture in San Antonio, but I'm gonna give you a little preview. Normalizing their D did not bring back the microbiome. And that is really the most important factor in improving sleep and chronic pain. Here's some misinformation. Vitamins and microbiome, here's what we've been taught. B vitamins come from the food, that's wrong. It, they don't come from the food. The bugs make them. The bacteria that live in your intestine make eight chemicals. If you have a normal diet, you don't need vitamins. That's probably true in the late 70s. But since the 80s, when everybody's becoming D deficient, because D is a needed growth factor for our microbiome, over the last 40 years, most of us have lost the microbiome. And as soon as you do, you are deficient. That means if you, you can have a normal diet and still have lots of vitamin deficiencies. It turns out that the final correct information is you have to keep your D level over 40 to have a normal human microbiome because D is a microbial growth factor. Low D for years, you lose your microbiome. If you lose your microbiome, you lose a vital organ of your body. So humans with an abnormal microbiome are not really normal humans. Why do I say that? And what are the things that go missing when you lose the bacteria that you were supposed to have when you lived outdoors? The eight B vitamins that are made by the bacteria in very specific ratios to one another and the raw materials that become the endocannabinoids. If you haven't linked yourself to the endocannabinoid literature, you need to. I'm gonna show you a couple more slides about it. The endocannabinoids are chemicals that we use in our nervous system for development for pain, for inflammation. They play a large role in not only brain and spinal cord early development, but the maintenance of a normal pain system. There are bacterial metabolites, chemicals that bacteria make that are absorbed and must be present for our body to sense our mineral levels. So, oh, could the bacteria be playing a role in iron deficiency and why there is an epidemic of needing an iron infusion because you can't absorb iron. It turns out the population that lives inside you is pivotal for our body to function normally in terms of, do I need more copper? Do I need to absorb more zinc? These are all cofactors that are needed to make the neurotransmitters that help sleep, that control our mood and our pain perception. Here is a very complicated article that actually tells us which specific species make which metabolites that are absorbed into the human body 
to allow us to sense whether we are in iron overload or whether we are in iron deficiency. Here is a very important article by Francesca Guida from 2020. She lowered the vitamin D she was supplying to the mice. Then she measured which species of bacteria went away when they didn't have a proper D supply, showed that those bacteria make the raw materials that are absorbed by the mouse and go into the mouse's brain and spinal cord and make for a normal pain system. She was then able to use a congener called andandamine to make their pain system come back to normal. And what she noticed in these mice is that they had what's called tactile allodynia. Tactile allodynia means soft moving touch is perceived as painful. That is a common finding in autistic kids, can't stand the label in their clothes, don't want to be touched because it feels uncomfortable. This is a very brief overview of how the cannabinoids are used in our nervous system to do all sorts of things. So we vilified cannabis and then we stopped doing scientific research into something that is a normal part of our nervous system. We make things called endocannabinoids because they look just like the cannabinoids you get from marijuana. So we have CBD1, CBD2. This is playing a role in why people are reaching for the cannabinoids because they are cannabinoid deficient. These are articles that are discussing the fact that cannabinoids are linked to suicide and mood. Role of endocannabinoid system in the neurobiology of suicide. Endocannabinoid system in borderline personality disorder. Role of the endocannabinoid system in depression and suicide. So they're actually doing autopsy studies on brains of teenagers who committed suicide showing that the endocannabinoid levels in their brain is too, are too low. Here are the increasing rates of depression over the, since 2009 to 2017. Here are the incidence of anxiety in teens. Here is the increase in migraine, 1994 to 2018. Increase in visits to the doctor for back and neck pain over the same period of time. So in summary, I'm gonna put it all together. We haven't gone deeply into the microbiome side of it and we'll do that in San Antonio. But in summary, all animals make D3 on their skin from the sun. One of the things I didn't mention yet is as we age, we make less D for the same time spent in the sun. That means if you live to be in your late 60s, early 70s, you can stay in the same habit of raising your own garden being out there picking your okra and the amount of D that you make with the same amount of time spent in the sun will go down. As your D drops below 30, your bugs start to go away and your B vitamins go low. And this creates a combined deficiency syndrome commonly called aging. We all do this. In the past, it was grandpa would go to the doctor the first time when he was 75 and he would invariably also have a sleep disorder. That means if we look at the things that we've called old people diseases, sleep problems, if you live old, long enough, you'll either fall asleep while you're talking to one of your friends or relatives, or you'll be up all night wandering around because you can't sleep at night. Their teeth fall out, directly related to D. Rheumatism, I start to have unexplained pain. Walk funny, fall down, constipation, memory loss, a heart failure, AFib, organ failure, depression, anxiety. These are all things that are moving into a younger and younger population. And the odd thing is, if you have, if you are over 60 and you have unexplained terrible pain throughout your body, and when people touch your muscles, it hurts, it's called polymyalgia rheumatica. It's been, a, it's been described for over a hundred years and your sedimentation rate is up and your C-reactive protein is up. And if you get prednisone, it goes away. But if you're 25 years old and you walk in and you have exactly the same set of symptoms, you're described as having fibromyalgia. That means when, it, when the doctor looks at the patient and says, well, you can't have polymyalgia rheumatica, you're 25, you're not 65. They just don't make the connection and say, wait, couldn't this be polymyalgia rheumatica presenting in a 25 year old? No, we've never seen that. Well, we're seeing it now. I had one of the ER physicians call me because he said, I don't know why I'm calling you exactly, but I just saw, saw the fourth kid in three months who had Bell's palsy. I've been practicing in this ER for 30 years. Kids don't get Bell's palsy. They do now. That means autoimmunity is an epidemic. It's presenting in very young children now. 
we used to see autoimmunity as a peak that would come in reproductive age women because they were have low D and lose their microbiome because they just had three babies. Now we see kids who are born to D deficient moms. The baby can't be given enough D because the mom's breast milk doesn't have the amount of D that it should have because we're still arguing about what the D dose should be instead of what the D level should be in a mom. And the mom doesn't have the right microbiome so that she can't supply that child the B vitamins that they need. And the kid doesn't have a high enough D to establish a normal microbiome. This, none of this is meant to say that what you guys are doing in airway dentistry is not the bomb. It is amazing. So we need each other. The brain and the airway both need to be addressed. On my website, I have a program that helps people over an entire year, year and a half to step through the phases that they need to, to get their microbiome back and how to adjust their D. I also have videos about how to use this program in pregnancy and, and in children based on age. I have individual coaching programs. We have Q and A sessions, and we have courses that are designed for clinicians who want to learn how to do this, not only in themselves and their kids, but in their patients as well. Our next course that's called the Virtual Right Sleep for Clinicians is in September. You can take a picture of this QR and it will take you to my website, but you can also just go to drgomanek.com and look for the courses section. I will also be doing two lectures in San Antonio. They were kind enough to invite me to do one that's about what we can learn from our patient's sleep to tell you some more clinical tips about how to interpret the answers that your patients give you about their sleep really differently than the sleep experts tell you. And then I'm giving the entire, this entire lecture on Friday, August 10th. And now I'll stop and ask for some questions if there are any. All right. Yes. Thank you so much, Sasha. That was great information. And so glad that we're going to have you join us in San Antonio with more information. I'm looking forward to it. Super excited. And um, I'll just kind of start with, with some questions here. The first one is, are vitamin D2 supplements potentially harmful as compared to D3? Absolutely. And because we've been giving them once a week, it's very difficult as a clinician to observe that. So once you know that D2 actually can bind to the receptor and block the D3 instead of actually being active, then you can actually interpret your patient's saying things like, oh, that's funny. Now that you tell me that, I always wake up with a headache on Sunday morning. I always take my D on Saturday. So giving D once a week is a ridiculous thing to do. It's, it's not meant to be that way. And giving something that is not our natural hormone is crazy. I mean, why would you give some non-testosterone, something that humans have never made and no animal on the planet makes to that animal when we have D3 readily available. And there are plenty of articles that have explored the fact that D2 and D3 are different chemicals. We just have actually done very odd things with this particular hormone that we would never dream of doing in any other setting. Why is there a term that says bioidentical hormones? Because we use estrogen, testosterone, cortisol as pharmaceuticals and we don't do it right. And the pharmaceutical industry wants to be able to find a way to make money on testosterone. So they make a once a month shot. Well, that's not the way the body really works. And that means there are actually terrible side effects that come from giving testosterone in huge doses once a month, for instance, strokes and all sorts of other things. And that means that we should take that education and apply it to D. And is, is vitamin B12 part of a vitamin B complex vitamin sufficient for the gut microbiome and sleep, or do we need an extra vitamin B12 vitamin supplement? Um, that is well covered on the workbook and it depends on what your B12 level is. So B, B12 is slightly different than the other Bs. That's a good question, but you actually have to get into this a little bit more in education. And what you should do is go to my website Download the workbook, read that, read all the education that you want on the website. It's all free. Um, but B12 is a big player in sleep. So are several of the other Bs. But using the Bs are is very complex. And that's why there's a workbook. 
Amazing, thank you. And again, we'll, um, we could send that link out too with your recording so people have that website link. Um, is there any hope in patients with inflammatory bowel disease who have chronic gut dysbiosis? Yes, do the right sleep program. It turns out that ulcerative colitis and Crohn's are two of the easiest things to fix. Um, and it's really, it's not just about getting a normal microbiome back, but if you read, uh, you watch the lecture in San Antonio, I go through how we get the microbiome back and it's a combination of D plus uh, large dose B complex because those are growth factors that the normal microbiome require. And it really turns out that one, once you get the microbiome back, usually the symptoms of the inflammatory bowel disease get much, much better. But the core of my idea is not that vitamins are good for people because they're not always. It's that you can use deficient vitamins to improve your sleep. And once you get somebody with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's sleeping better, that is where the immune system starts to heal itself. So we've been taught that autoimmunity is permanent and that it's a genetic disease. That's not true. It has genetic factors that make some people get inflammatory bowel disease and other people get rheumatoid arthritis and other people not get autoimmunity, but you can actually affect the immune system by sleeping better. And I got to see some of my patients who had autoimmune neurologic illness over a span of three years or so, not only get their disease process not to be active anymore, but we were able to withdraw the autoimmune modifying drugs. So we were able to take away the immune modulating drugs. And actually Crohn's and, and ulcerative colitis are some of the easiest to treat using this. And it just goes away. As long as you keep your D up after that and you keep paying attention to your sleep, they get better and stay better. And what should be the max level of D hormone in the blood? 60 to 80 for better sleep. Is the decrease in vitamin D with age adaptive in any way from an evolutionary perspective? There's only one person who's uh, proposed, well, it's evolutionary. It's a good thing for the population that old people die off. If we all live to be 300 years old, things would be a lot different. So it's not particularly good for the individual, but every animal has a lifespan. And it turns out there is one biochemist who has a fascinating explanation that has to do with the acquiring of more and more deuterium, which is a very long, complicated explanation, but I think he's right. So what to remember is nah, that happens in all species. It happens in dogs who have a shorter lifespan. So the same diseases result in dogs that we keep indoors, but their lifespan is 14 years. So it happens sooner. So it's much more complex than I'm making now to be. D is extraordinarily complex. And I really don't, I could lecture about it all day long and you'll see more lectures once you get to my website that are about mm, more nuanced aspects about D. All right. Wonderful. I think that um, wraps up our questions. Again, um, thank you so much, Sasha, for your time. And we look forward to hearing more from you in San Antonio. And um, thank you, everyone in attendance. Again, we'll email the recording um, within seven business days and members will get their CE certificate of attendance within 30. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Have a great night.